Hello, welcome to Start Soup. I'm Martin Rogers here with Professor Tony Travers to discuss this year's local elections. Welcome, Tony. Martin. So, first of all, what elections are being held this year? Well, we've got a big suite of elections this year. Uh, we have the Scottish Parliament, Welsh Assembly, Northern Ireland Assembly all up for election. There are police and crime commissioners throughout England and Wales, local elections in England, the London Mayor and Assembly are up. There are some mayoral contests in three cities, in Liverpool, in Salford and in Bristol. And then, of course, uh, seven weeks after all of that, the EU referendum, which in many ways is the big one. So why do these elections matter? Well, I think they matter because, on the one hand, they tell us something about the underlying state of British politics in different parts of the United Kingdom. But, of course, in the EU referendum's case, it's a sort of uh, once and for all, well, at least one for a generation, let us assume, uh, vote which could have profound implications for the way Britain is governed, for sovereignty, for uh, a whole range of things, and in the short term for the economy. So that in particular, I think, is overshadowing all these other elections because uh, it's a, a sort of once, well, it's not once in a lifetime, once in a generation type vote. So to go into the local elections, so I think these are particularly interesting because you have a difference between the sort of structural longer term factors and the short term factors which are maybe going to affect how people vote. So um, the Conservatives have in one form or another been in power for six years including the coalition. We've had austerity or fiscal consolidation. We have a number of um, short term political issues from the doctor strike to um, John Whittingdale. And how do you think these two short-term and long-term facts are going to affect how people vote? I mean, there's no question that there's been a lot of big political news recently. Um, in addition to all the ones you mentioned, there's the fallout from the Panama Papers and the budget. And, you know, you'd have to say, looking at them in the round, the government has not had the best three, four weeks. Um, which, you know, has allowed the Labour Party, which has its own pro problems, to appear to get the government on the back foot a bit, which is, hasn't happened much. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see if this shows up in opinion polls and therefore when it comes to voting in the local elections. The thing about the local elections, which take place throughout England, is that they probably, because they're first past the post, take place everywhere, well, not obviously everywhere, but in many parts of the country, give us a better sort of test of general election type public opinion uh, than, let's say, the Scottish or the Welsh or the London mayoral contest, which tell us something specific about them, but not quite as much about the broad drift of politics. So a lot of the longer term factors are currently favouring the Labour Party, the opposition, you'd have to say. Um, but their opinion polling is not on the sort of path to power, judging by the precedent set by previous elections. So how do you think this is likely to play out? I mean, Labour ought to be doing better than this in opinion polls. Well, we haven't seen many recently, you know, but what we'll find out on local election day is how the national equivalent vote, that is, you know, the votes um, represented by academics, uh, Colin Rallings and Michael Thrasher, in particular, how they uh, play out, or how would they, they would play out if there had been a general election right across the country and using these results to try to create that result. Now, normally, an opposition party, one year out from a general election, should be beginning to score well, win council seats, and so on. Now, in fairness to Labour, the last time these local elections were fought, and indeed the London election, was in 2012, which was a high watermark for Ed Miliband and the Labour Party. They did rather well. So they're now fighting against that background. But even so, I mean, if they do worse uh, you know, than, than Ed Miliband did in 2012, that's not a great sign for the Labour Party, to put it mildly. Now, the work that we've done showed that it's pretty much unprecedented for an opposition to be falling back in a non-general election year. So this could be quite an um, opportunity for the Conservative Party, given how many factors are in Labour's 
in the opposition party's favour um, if the Conservatives are able to consolidate or improve this position, that would be quite an achievement for them. It's true, and recent uh, projections, and they are projections only, of course, produced by Colin Rallings and Michael Thrasher from the University of Plymouth, show the Conservatives potentially gaining up to 50 seats uh, in 2016, based on Rallings and Thrasher's own work looking at local by-elections. So, uh, and Labour, they think, might lose up to 150. Now, in fairness to them, it's very hard to make these projections in advance. But yes, the Conservatives could actually, from a position of having been in power for one year on their own and six years uh, as part of the coalition or now, if they made some gains, that would, I think, comfort Conservatives that despite everything that had happened in the recent weeks, they were still able to score wins. And certainly the electorate, I think, would probably read it like that. And to move on to the Liberal Democrats, they've been, though they were wiped out virtually at the general election in 2015 as a parliamentary force, but have maintained some sort of, sort of foothold in local government places like Watford, they've maintained power. This is quite a big election for the Lib Dems, isn't it? They have the potential to take some votes back from the Conservatives, or that will at least be their aim, and also to attempt to make gains from Labour and to consolidate some sort of fight back. So what are their prospects and where should we need look for the sort of key contests? It's true that I mean, the Lib Dems had a catastrophic year in the general election in 2015, and not a brilliant year in 2012 when these local elections were last being fought. So you might think from their point of view, if they are showing any signs of recovery, this would be the year when it would show through. And the polling suggests they might do somewhat better than uh, in these seats last time. And of course, in the London mayoral election, they'll be hoping not to you know, rule out any result at this point, but the polling suggests they might come third, which doesn't sound like a great objective, but actually they came fourth last time. So that would be uh, suggestive that the Lib Dems were slowly but surely building back. That would start in local government. And if they are to do this at all, it's going to take years and it will start in elections of, this, of, of the kind we're seeing this year. So to move on to UKIP, this is, a, in a way, this is UKIP's moment with the European issue and immigration raised in salience due to the referendum in June. Has there been much sign so far of UKIP, power, you know, UKIP who almost did so well in the referendum, got nearly four million votes, only one parliamentary seat, but seem to have fallen back. Some of their momentum has maybe gone since that result. What prospects have they got for establishing themselves as a serious force? I mean, it is interesting that despite the fact that, you know, uh, UKIP have got their heart's desire, there is an EU referendum this year, uh, it hasn't yet obviously translated through into big poll shifts and therefore not necessarily into uh, big winnings in local government elections. But we'll see. I mean, there are a number of places, some of them, and you, you've researched this, I know, uh, in Essex, for example, and along the east of England, where UKIP might hope to pick up seats, and also, of course, in some of the northern metropolitan and Midlands metropolitan areas, where Labour faces little opposition. Can UKIP break through there? So I think that uh, you know, UKIP are under quite a lot of pressure here, because if they don't make a breakthrough of any kind, or even don't keep the momentum of moving forward, in this of all years, then it kind of you know, suggests yet again they're going to fall back after the referendum, whatever the result. And so to move finally on to the referendum, it's difficult maybe to tell what it, which side is leading at the moment. What are likely to be the factors at play? Um, what's turnout likely to be? What do you think is possibly likely to happen with regard to the referendum? Well. I mean, the polling, and because there is this intriguing issue that phone polls and internet polls show rather different, or have been showing rather different results, but the polling shows a nearly 50-50 sort of breakdown between leave and stay. And that means, uh, as politicians are fond of saying, there's everything to fight for. Oddly, actually, I suspect it does suit both sides. The last thing either side wants is 
for it to look like a done deal and therefore their supporters stay at home. Now, of course, that cancels it, 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 cancels it itself out to some degree uh, if it's level pegging. But that does mean they're all pushing hard. Uh, we've seen the controversy recently about the uh, government's note that they're sending out to everybody throughout the UK, first in England, uh, then to Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland promoting the benefits of staying in. That's produced a backlash amongst the Leave campaign, who believe this is an unreasonable use of government resources. I think the impact on the local elections in England and on the Scottish, Welsh, Northern Ireland and London elections is that this, the EU is sort of creating a shadow. I think when um, uh, campaigners turn up at people's doors and start talking about the council elections or the Welsh elections or the Scottish elections, I think people are going to be expecting them to, to talk about the EU, which is so much more in the news. So I think it's the, the reason the EU referendum matters is that it's causing issues for the major political parties, it's getting a lot of media attention and it's overshadowing in some ways the normal democratic activities within the UK. Do you think that any greater turnout in one set of elections is likely to impact on the other, so whether a turnout of the uh, council or local elections is likely to result in a lower or higher turnout of the re referendum or vice versa? I mean, all the indications suggest that the referendum turnout will be higher than the local elections. Now, um, quite how high, hard to tell. I mean, probably not quite as high as a general election, though it might be. Uh, general elections typically 65 to 70 percent. This perhaps the referendum could be in the 50 to 60 percent range. Local elections typically come out 35 to 40 percent. The interesting question is, well, will people think, well, I'm voting in the referendum? You know, that's once. Uh, do I turn out twice within seven or eight weeks? Now, you know, I'm sure people will do their civic duty, but you have to say, I think turnout it's just the slightest possibility that the existence of the EU referendum could slightly lower the turnout in the local and Scottish, Welsh, Northern Irish and London elections taking place on May the 5th. Great. All right. Thank you very much, Tony. You're off the hot seat. Thanks, Mark.